Hello and welcome back to the second part of our special note in which we're discussing this book, Emerging Markets in an Upside Down World. As we've already discussed, it's necessary to challenge our perceptions about risk, and particularly how risk varies between the developed and the emerging world. Today, I'd like to discuss more about how we might actually deal with those problems when it comes to policy and when it comes to investment. So let's talk once more to the author, Jerome Booth. Thanks Thank once again. So, we, we've we can agree that perhaps we need to reallocate our notions of, of mm -hmm. risk. Where is the difference, though, between the core and the periphery of the global economy? Where, where should we be allocating money? On what basis should we be doing so? Well, I think what we do have is exactly what, what I call a core periphery disease. And, mm. and I call it a disease because it's a deeply seated meme, uh, right. which has been with us for several hundred years. The idea that uh, the periphery may affect, uh, sorry, the core may affect the periphery, but we can ignore the effect of the periphery on the core. So we've got this concept mm. that asset classes are all about developed markets, and there's this tiny little thing called emerging markets, which we needn't bother about. Which people, but, but because people have behaved on that basis for a long time, that has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, it has point, in terms of period. some people's perception. But mm. there's a big difference between perception and reality. The reality is that 85% mm. of the world's population live in emerging markets. On uh, With GPP about 50% basis, of the economy at this point. About 50% right? of the economy. Right. It's most of the growth. Um, it will also be driving things like uh, the purchasing uh, 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 power of our pensioners in future. Mm. If you are, say, living in the UK or another developed country, particularly the UK, for example, as an open economy, mm. and you're thinking about your pension retiring in 20 years, what you actually want is not, £2,000, because we might have a bout of inflation like we did in the 70s, right. by the way, in the interim, which is not um, um, that unlikely. And so £2,000 might buy you know, a loaf of bread. Right. What you actually want is the ability to purchase your you know, cars and fuel and food. And by that time, maybe 50% of those things will be produced and, and, right. and, and you know, bought and sold mostly in the emerging world, and they sure. will be pricing. So we have to think of the liabilities as being in the emerging markets. We have to therefore think that if we're not there, we're actually taking a risk. OK, now on the subject of liabilities, let's take a look at debt. Yes. Uh, and this is a very, this again is a, a chart that perhaps challenges perception. Debt is steadily decreasing, only slightly bobbled yeah. up after the crisis in the emerging world and rather more than steadily increasing in the developed That's world. That's right. How does this imbalance get itself well, addressed? Well, this is, this is a, a very, very important macroeconomic reality and this is mm. just the public sector debt. You know, if you include private sector debt, then the GDP, the debt to GDP in the UK is about 500%. Yes. Um, and on average, it's about 10 times. It's about 250% in developed countries versus 25% in the emerging world. And it's because this huge debt build-up that we have all these austerity measures we're facing de you know years if not more than a decade of low growth and it's in the emerging markets where we have all the dynamism it's also this difference which gives the power to emerging markets because they're the net creditors and they also are where you're going to see much more growth so we should be and people often talk about this in rather rather manichaean terms with, the, with regard to the Chinese the Chi yeah. China has been lending an awful lot of money to the US yeah. and that gives them a certain degree of power in the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we have uh, suddenly uh, the Chinese, the Russians, you know, we took, we're in a period where we just, ev with events in Crimea, the mm. Russians have got enough reserves to cause a serious disruption to the US Treasury okay, and therefore we, the dollar. We can illustrate reserves for you on this uh, uh, shortly as well. Yes. Again, very dramatic how those yes. reserves have increased. And again, doesn't include the, the, the sovereign wealth funds. You know, so the emerging market central banks mm. now hold about 80% of the world's central bank reserves. They are the net creditors. And we've seen the current right. international monetary system break down in 1971. Uh, that's the precedent for maybe some of the things that may happen in the future. Because in 71, mm. it's very interesting, the net creditor countries then were Europe versus the debtor or the, the, problem, the country in problems uh, uh, not able to meet its gold commitment in the US. Mm. And the US came off gold. And the dollar went right down from $35 an ounce to 195 Huge devaluation. Yes, Nixon uh, decided over a weekend in Camp Nixon that actually I'm not going to repay. Exactly. It, exactly. Yes, and he right. didn't really have, but the point is, he didn't really have a choice. Because if he yes. had, he, otherwise he was going to run out of gold and then he would have had to do the same anyway. Mm. So the point is, the creditors in a monetary crisis call the shots. The creditors today are the emerging market central banks. The idea that they you know, don't have the capacity to act is completely wrong. So if what, they what are, are they going to do then? What is going to well, be? We, we're running uh, towards a crisis for the post Bretton Woods yes, world, just we as are. we had this, the Bretton Woods crisis in 71. The, What's it going to look this like? This is a huge issue. We probably don't have time to co cover it. It is we can in give the book, it a go. Come but on. basically, yeah. I think there are a lot, several scenarios. But one thing's very clear. 
the, the possibility that there has to be an adjustment in currencies in favour of the creditor nations. Right. How we manage that is going to be very tricky. The bargaining power lies with the emerging markets. What I address in the book is, is actually not just a, a sort of checklist for investors, how they should rethink the way they invest. And a lot of this is about, I don't have a new model. Hmm. I'm just saying there isn't a model. The old model doesn't work. You have to complement with that with thinking. Think about some of the other factors that you haven't been thinking about, like macroeconomics, like politics, like history. But also for the policymaker, I've got a huge checklist, both for developed right. and developing countries. And then the impact of that for investors. And the issues of you know, developed versus EM debt is one of those issues which will drive the policy process of what happens to currencies. But in the very long term, I guess the final question, you see emerging market currencies steadily gaining. Yeah. And the dollar and the other big Western, if we have to use the word Western for want of a better word, I call them currencies. Hedics, heavily indebted developers. Yeah, yes, yeah, so and the, the yen <laughs> is also in there, which perhaps isn't yes. that. that you, you, you see an, in, an inexorable progress of strengthening for the emerging market I, currencies. I think, I think it's not just that. I, th I think that's true. I think it's also the case that we have to realise that rich countries have got a huge debt burden and they are not going to just pay it off through growth. They are going to uh, rob their savers. They're going to rob foreign mm -hmm. savers. And they're going to do that through a combination of financial repression and or uh, inflation devaluation. And it's, uh, at the moment, the strategy is to, is to do financial repression, which is, in other words, keep negative interest rates low, uh -huh. but, but negative. Um, if that kind of fails, because bond, the bond markets, you know, uh, d you know, demand a higher real mm. interest rate, then you've got the potential of a 1970s type scenario. And that would accelerate this, this devaluation process. But one way or another, real prices are going to adjust and the, and the purchasing power of the emerging markets is going to increase. The exchange rates in real terms are also going to increase. OK, Jerome, thank you very much indeed. That was a fairly complete statement of some very provocative but very difficult to deny beliefs. The rest of them are in this book. I hope you found that a useful and interesting conversation. I know I did.